Okay, thank you. So, uh, hello, my name is Michael, nice to meet you. And I would like to talk to you about the project I'm working on. It's called Copper. And uh, here are some of my colleagues. Uh, so I might invite them uh, in the middle of the talk to talk about something we will see. And particularly, I would like to mention what's new in Copper, like what features we have recently introduced. Some features might be interesting for you, so I hope that will be the case. Maybe not. Uh, who doesn't know Copper here? Okay. <laughs> uh, so, just to get like basic context for this talk, I will briefly introduce it, even though most of you probably know something or heard of it. Uh, so, Copper is an RPM build system. It's basically a tool that can take your source code uh, that you are working on and it can make it a YAM repository. It can produce YAM repository from your source code. So if you are a developer, uh, you are making, making some new cool application. This is something uh, you, might, you might want to easily get your work uh, distributed to your end users. And this is basically the main idea to make YAM repositories out of people's source code. But okay, so we have this platform, we have this tool that is able to do this task, but what is actually our mission? What do we want to do with this platform? Where we want to go? So uh, it can be summarized like this. Our mission uh, is to make this platform, these are two developers on the platform. So our goal is to make this platform as stable as possible so that people can actually rely on it. Because if you are a software developer, you want your end users to be happy and you want them to always uh, get the latest software that you are producing. Because it may contain some bug fix and uh, if it is security bug fix uh, or some sort of bug fix that's good to get to users fast, the platform needs to be reliable. But we also uh, want to make it easy to use at the same time. Uh, ideally, this middle piece uh, in this diagram in this diagram should not be uh, visible to users. Like ideal case would be that you are, you are just editing uh, lines of code and somewhere without you maybe even knowing RPMs are produced that uh, end users consume, that end users install and use. This is like ideal s scenario that you don't need to set up anything. But uh, it's a long way to go. Maybe we won't be able to achieve this completely, but it's I think a uh, good, good goal to have in mind. And finally, uh, we also would like to be attractive. We would like to attract new people to Copper because Copper actually stands for community projects and we would like to make community around RPM ecosystem uh, bigger and maybe happier. So we uh, need to make sure that all the possible use cases that people might have, because there are like tons of tons of use cases, are supported by Copper, so that they can use uh, the, our project and not use possibly some other projects that has more features or is more stable and so on. And I would like to also mention that uh, by developers, I don't mean just upstream developers. Actually, we are focusing also on federal developers and uh, namely package maintainers. And this is something I think uh, we can bring uh, something into the game with this because it's not obvious that uh, there can be a system that can support both of these groups because use cases in these two groups are usually uh, quite a bit different. Package maintainer usually uses this git which means a Git repository with patches, spec file, and tarballs, whereas upstream developers usually uh, work with upstream sources uh, with 
raw source code, uh, C files, PY files, RB files, and so on. So it's interesting that Copper actually aims to support both of these groups. So uh, I mentioned that uh, we would like to be attractive to new, new users to step back a little bit. And uh, for that, we have introduced some new build methods into Copper. Uh, traditionally, and it is even nowadays the most used method, is uploading as RPMs into Copper. You basically have some sources checked out locally, you build an SRPM, and you upload it to Copper to build RPMs from it. This is cool, and this is still the most uh, used use case, as I can see every day, uh, in Copper. But uh, it has some disadvantages, and it doesn't allow certain things. Namely, you, you are responsible, you need to build your SRPM yourself, some manual work that you need to do in addition, and you need to upload it. SRPM can be huge, like, I don't know, like uh, 200 uh, megabytes. And it also doesn't allow uh, continuous integration because uh, developers very often, they want uh, results of their builds get reported back to their source forge. And if you need to manually build um, the SRPM in the middle, then this use case is not possible. So to really make sure that we can support as wide range of user use cases as possible, we have introduced the following uh, three methods. Um, SCM, make SRPM, custom, and SCM RPKG. So I would like to introduce them briefly. Actually, there is a, there is a cool project, uh, Bored Upstream Cryo Family on a copper. This is a copper, and uh, it contains packages, the latest packages from uh, Project Atomic, from their GitHub uh, project page. So you can check it out, and I will actually demonstrate um, the make, make SRPM and custom method on this project, because they have really nice setup. So I think uh, I wouldn't be able to make a better example than this. And I will start with make SRPM. So if you want to uh, use this method in Copper, you basically just uh, need to specify clone URL. This is pointing to the GitHub project atomic page. You may uh, want to specify branch. Uh, we call it committish because it can be a reference, it can be tag, but, but usually uh, there is a branch there. And uh, you, if you want auto, auto rebuild on a new pushes, um, you just check uh, auto rebuild option on, and you choose make as RPM as a, as a source RPM build method. But uh, this is not uh, everything you need to do. Uh, you actually uh, also need to provide this make file in your Git repository that's getting built by the make as RPM method. And this make file uh, is expected to be located at .copper hidden directory in your, in your top level Git repository, uh, Git directory of your Git repository. And uh, uh, it should contain as RPM target and copper. If you make new, new build uh, with this method, copper will clone the remote repository and it will invoke this as RPM target in the make file so that SRPM is actually produced, as it would be if you did it locally. And from that point, if the SRPM is produced, then Copper can do what, what uh, it usually does with uh, uploaded source RPM, for example. So the procedure is then the same. SRPM gets built into RPMs, and create repo uh, C is invoked to actually create the uh, resulting YAM repository. So this SRPM method should just produce some source RPM into uh, auditor. And we can see that uh, before that, uh, there is uh, some invocation of uh, prepare sh script. So let's see what it does. This is quite interesting. So uh, you can see that uh, actually from this prepare sh script, you can install stuff. Uh, which um, many people uh, consider like unexpected. You are actually you have actually root privileges there. This is run in a mock root, and uh, you have 
uh, root privileges, root user, with some stripped down capabilities. So it's like safe, secure, because we stripped it down like to bare minimum that you need to actually build something. But you can install stuff at the same time. So here, if Git is not present, it will be installed. This is because uh, somebody wants to also test it lo locally. So he has Git already installed, so he doesn't need to uh, call DNF locally. Uh, and then there, uh, there are some substitutions. You can notice that uh, those substitutions are done on some uh, Podman spec in, which is presumably a spec file template. So uh, basically those uh, hash commit, hash short commit, hash commit num, hash commit date are some tags that are placed uh, in that spec file template and they get uh, substituted here uh, from some values that uh, are computed from Git history. So why anyone uh, would want to do this, like sub do some weird substitution here, substitutions that should just modify spec file before uh, the SRPM, the final SRPM, is actually built. The reason is that uh, with this method, with those kind of sus substitutions, you can make your RPMs uh, follow Git history of your project. Basically, name of the produced RPMs will contain, for example, Git hash of the commit that the source for the source RPM comes from the, the, the source archive. So from the name of the final RPMs, you immediately are, you are immediately able to recognize from which commit this RPM comes from. And this is very useful for debugging. Because if there is some bug in the, the produced RPM, uh, you immediately know where to jump uh, into in your code base. So some substitutions are done and then git archive uh, is called to actually pack uh, the source uh, repository or, co or content of the repository into tarball and uh, spec and uh, tarball are then used to actually uh, build an SRPM. So uh, this was make SRPM method. Now custom method. Um, custom method is actually very similar to make SRPM. The only difference basically is that the script is not uh, placed in the remote Git repository, but it is stored directly in CopperDB. And this has some dis some advantages, sorry, uh, because um, if you are, for example, a package maintainer and you care about upstream not breaking your package, you are able to uh, set up a custom package in Copper and then just ask upstream to uh, put webhook that will invoke builds of this package in Copper into their webhook settings in GitHub. So basically, you just, need, you just ask upstream, please include me this webhook and that's it. You take care of all the other stuff that's needed to actually build a working package from uh, the upstream sources. So you don't need to ask them, like, please put this weird dot copper make file some, somewhere. You just need this. So that's, that's quite nice. And uh, also, it has some uh, extended uh, attributes when compared to uh, make SRPM. With make SRPM, you install uh, stuff manually into Chirut, but here you can specify, you can even specify which Chirut it should be, whether it should be Fedora, the latest branch Fedora, uh, or some, or Fedora Rawhide. And you can also just put a list here which specifies uh, what packages should be installed before uh, the SRPM is actually built. So what dependencies are there to build uh, the source RPM? And also result di directory there where the SRPM is expected to be put by script, where Cooper can find it afterwards and take it and build RPMs from it. So custom, nice method. And RPKG. RPKG 
uh, again allows you to build uh, source RPMs from uh, remote Git or even SVN repositories. Uh, but uh, it is much easier to set up because the only thing that you need for make uh, for RPKG to work, RPKG method, is just spec file or spec file template in the remote repository, and you don't need the script that actually builds the, the source RPM. And even uh, as you you could see, there were the set substitutions in the previous script and here. So RPKG uh, has actually a built-in solution for this. It has a library of tags that are supported in the spec file template that it, it can recognize. For example, uh, git version, which will automatically generate a version string that contains a number of commits from the latest tag and git hash. So it will do uh, those substitutions for you. And you can even specify your own macros if you want. So you could possibly generate build dependencies at source RPM build time, which is pretty, I think, interesting option. And another <laughs> cool thing is that by default, it can work with uh, upstream repositories, uh, unpacked sources. But it can also work with uh, diskit repositories, with packed sources. And you just specify clone URL. And it doesn't care if it is uh, packed or unpacked. It will produce SRPM no matter what the type is. And this, this is quite cool that it uh, both inputs are, uh, are actually supported by RPKG method. So here, uh, the settings that you uh, can see are quite uh, many. There is uh, a committish parameter specified master, the branch, but also subdirectory and spec file. The name of the spec file and subdirectory means where uh, the RPKG command should be called. You actually don't need to uh, specify these parameters. They are optional. If you had just a uh, flat a git repository where your spec file is placed in a top level directory, then this is uh, optional because RPKG, when it produces uh, SRPM, will auto locate spec file and uh, it can work from there on. And also, it is a tool that you can install. Uh, f for example, then if, uh, install RPKG from Fedora repositories, and if there is something uh, off with the setup, if there is some problem, you can just de debug it locally. Uh, the previous two methods, they are a bit uh, difficult to reproduce locally. Okay, so we have some n new methods, like some methods that we hope will support like wide range of use cases, but uh, this is not enough to be attractive for new this is like, this is cool that we can build in like thousand ways, but this is not really, not uh, really the thing that developers want. Uh, not the only thing. Another thing they usually want is to get builds or build results reported back to their source forge. Source forge. So, so for example, if there is a new pull request coming into their project, they want to see if the changes actually are valid and that the project builds uh, with those changes. This can be very useful uh, because you might immediately uh, uh, fix some problems before they are actually merged. So uh, we have focused on this problem. This is like part of uh, CI of continuous integration. It's only a part because ideally we would like to be we would also like to be able to run some tests afterwards some integration tests but we just focused on this part first and we have implemented um, SCM integration with Pegure. This might seem like poor because um, it's just Pegure. We, we can actually also there is like GitHub, GitLab, uh, Bitbucket, and we don't have an integration with those sites. But it's 
not that bad because uh, Fedora Distgit uses Pegure, which means that you can use this uh, feature with Fedora, Fedora Distgit. Pegure IO, of course, uses Pegure. Upstream first uses Pegure, and then there might be more Pegure instances. So uh, any source forge that uh, uses Pegure is supported just uh, by adding this feature, which is cool. This is like great advantages of Pegure that it can be really used for also for wide range of uh, use cases. So I would like to show you a demo of this. I will show it on production copper and production federalist git. So I'm curious if it will work. Yes. Okay. And I will actually start uh, from scratch. I already have created some project here. So I have this package uh, on Federal Disk Kit, and I would like to get it auto rebuilt when new changes arrive, and also I would like to get uh, the build results reported uh, feedback uh, feedback uh, to the pull requests. So I will create the project. The name can be arbitrary, but I chose uh, the name that uh, is the same as uh, the package name. I, uh, I will create a package definition for the this git package, which basically describes how, how the package gets built. So I will uh, just copy this. And uh, I will specify package name. And I can basically, OK, I need to uh, check this. So. And uh, RPKG is OK. So I can submit it. So at this point, uh, if a new change arrives in the master branch of the package, it will get auto built in copper. Uh, in this in this particular copper, but it will uh, not be reported back. For that, I need to go to settings, integration step, and I should enter uh, URL of the project. And also an API key for the project. So this is basically uh, API uh, setup so that Copper knows um, uh, the credentials. Just a moment, please. Uh, so I will create a new key just to flag pull requests. So I don't mind if you use it for something. We would try to use it for something else, or if you like my pull request during presentation. And I will copy uh, the API key here. Okay. All right, so we should be uh, set up now. So let's try some pull request. I will actually uh, I will actually use a display request that uh, already exists, and I will just make a new change to the already existing pull request. That will work with a new pull requests that are uh, filed uh, as new as well. But I can use also this one, which already exists, and a new change is added to it. So I will view my fork. 
and let's do some modification. So test four. And commit. Okay, so let's see if the change is visible in the in the pull, in the pull request of the main repo. Okay, so it's here. So let's see if there is something happening in the scoper. Yeah, maybe, yeah, <laughs> I didn't notice. So it's here, it's building. Importing phase, uh, here you can see uh, the forked repo, the origin repo for the build, and uh, the reference on the hash of the git commit gets that, get, uh, that is getting built. And uh, it's cool that from here, I can easily get back uh, to the pull request. So you have nice linking between do those two things. So uh, copper build is here, also simple Koji uh, CI got triggered. And from this link, I can get back to the build. So th it's nice that you can jump between uh, those two. And uh, also directory thing here. This is actually uh, something that I can use to enable builds from this pull request and install packages from this pull request and test them locally. So uh, I can invoke this command. And I think it's PR2, maybe I'm not correct. And PR stands for pull request. Okay, so it doesn't exist. <laughs> Module macro, okay. All right, so I have it en enabled and that means I can install packages from this pull request. So, uh, so uh, ideally, I would like to do this uh, uh, in my normal work uh, in a container, for example, because it depends how you trust uh, that pull request. Uh, so, you might want to do this in a container, actually. Uh, so, I will just uh, have a look what packages uh, are there by using uh, DNF Repo Query plugin. So they have this new, cute, uh, nice switch. Okay. Well, not sure what's going on, but uh, I think the packages should be there. Well, not sure, but yeah, but uh, I probably made some mistake, but uh, you can see that uh, the modular macros PR2 YAM repository got synchronize successfully and uh, that I can install stuff from there. All right. So this is something that you can use for uh, developing. And we have also uh, introduced new API finally after many years and I would like to introduce Jakub here and he will tell you more about this. Uh, hello everyone, 
can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, nice. Uh, so in the following five minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, the new API. Uh, I bet that the first thought that comes to your head is why? Why do we need another API version? There are already two of them. Well, none of, the, none of them is complete. Uh, they both provide uh, some features, but also lack some features. And uh, yeah, um, we could uh, possibly uh, pick one of them and finish it, but uh, it's not that easy. There are several issues that uh, is not possible to solve without breaking a backward compatibility a lot. So we decided that it would be probably better to just create a new API version and give you enough time to learn it and migrate to it. So what uh, did we want to achieve? Um, well, the first API version is here for years. We, you seem to like it, we really like using it. So we wanted to take uh, a good things that uh, are in the first API version and uh, do the things that don't work differently. Mainly, we wanted to have uh, JSON everywhere for both get requests but also post requests. So uh, it will allow us to easily fix uh, many, many uh, data type issues that the first API version had. Uh, there were a lot of another goals but uh, I just uh, want to show you a demo. So. I apologize, I don't have a live demo because I don't like to live my life as dangerously as Michal here, but it will be awesome, I promise. Okay, nice. Here we have a terminal window with IPython in it, and we'll try to type some commands. So, first uh, we need to import a version 3 client Bam. Uh, and create a client object from it. We will use uh, a default dot config uh, slash uh, copper uh, configuration. And let's, for example, try to create a new project. So we define some choose variable, not important. And we will create a project. It will be called flock and it will be owned by a uh, copper group. Now we, ha now we have a project created and uh, the result is stored in project variable. Uh, what do we know about it? It has attributes and it has more attributes and it has many, many more attributes. Try it and see. Um, so what can we do next? Let's try, for example, submit some build. Uh, here we have a source RPM package for testing purposes, and we'll try to submit it to our project. So we will use attributes from the project variable and so on. Bam. Build is submitted, and we can see what is going on here. It has this ID and it is importing right now. Awesome, right? Uh, if you want to know more, please read about uh, uh, read, read my blog post about the new API. There are links to the documentation and many explanations and everything. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have some new build methods. Uh, we have some kind of s continuous integration that we want to continue working on and the new API. So what's next? Uh, 
right now, even right now, we are working on a support uh, for multiple copper instances uh, in DNF copper plugin, which uh, is interesting because uh, it uh, enables people to deploy their own copper instance uh, anywhere in the world if they want to. And some people uh, might uh, find that uh, useful because, for example, if you want to create your own distribution, Copper might be a tool very suitable for this task. We don't have composes. Uh, we have just separate uh, YAM repositories for each uh, user and each project. So that part is missing, but otherwise uh, this is something that can be implemented uh, by a custom solution at the moment. And actually, uh, University of New York uh, started to use Copper RPM build, which is our uh, builder package f in in their custom solution to make a Fedora remix. So this is quite interesting that uh, it's actually getting used like this, even though it's uh, just Copper RPM build, not the whole Copper stack. But uh, we need uh, more work to actually make the whole Copper stack uh, easily uh, deployable. What we would also like to do uh, are application test suits automatically run after build so that you don't uh, get just a build result in a pull request but also test results and this is nice because okay you can uh, run some tests in check uh, section of a spec file but if you want to run integration tests that are testing uh, your package in a larger context in a larger a group of packages that are supposed to work together, then do you need uh, integration tests that will just uh, do the whole uh, deployment of your packages and test how they work together. So this is something we would like uh, to achieve. Uh, no, uh, very soon I would I would say. And uh, right now we have a Copper Disk Kit, but it only serves as a a log as a build log. You can find uh, their builds that were built in the past uh, there, but it's not writable, it's read only. Uh, people wanted to interact uh, with it to actually um, make changes there, to make some development there. So we would like to make uh, this possible and to open Copper Disk Kit for public writing. <coughs> We are also uh, considering building uh, container images, but uh, the implementation of it we are unsure uh, of at the moment. We are considering some options uh, using uh, project atomic packages, uh, like for example Podman or, or Buildach, but uh, this is still uh, in consideration, I would say. And the question also is, we actually can uh, handle uh, the size requirements that are related to storing a large num number of container images. And that's it. Uh, so I would like to uh, thank you. And uh, if you have some questions now. Okay. Yes, yes, this is something we would like to implement. And uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, the question was if it is possible uh, for us to implement. Uh, automatic task uh, triggering after builds uh, that users can set up some custom uh, task uh, that they want to uh, run after a successful build. Uh, if this is possible to implement in Copper and if, if we plan it and ye yes, we would, like, we would like to have this feature, of course. And uh, we are thinking about uh, integration with uh, Taskotron, actually. There are mm, more possibilities than just that, but uh, Taskotron is certainly one of the of the options there. Any other questions? Yes. 
Uh, well, it actually is possible uh, even nowadays because we emit FedMessage uh, notification. So you can set up FedMessage uh, Watch is the name of the project, uh, which will allow you to uh, set up uh, your own script uh, when some custom uh, FedMessage arrives. So you can just write that on copper notification. You, your script should be executed and you can do that nowadays as well. Uh, all right, thanks. Uh, I didn't realize that. So this is this uh, is also possible right now even. Um, any other question? Neil? Right. Right. Cool. So the question was uh, how difficult it is actually to uh, deploy an own copper instance. Uh, is that right? Uh, right now it is uh, quite difficult, I would say. Uh, it is difficult to uh, make everything, uh, the whole stack, uh, deployed and working. Um, and we are actually thinking about writing uh, Ansible playbooks that would be able to do it for you and uh, you would basically just provide IPS of uh, the target machines that should get deployed and you would run uh, the Ansible playbook and the setup would just run and you would have your own copper instance. So this is what we would like to have and to, uh, if we have it, we will also use it for our testing suits. So basically we will, instead of bare machines of virtual machines somewhere, we will be deploying local containers and then, run, then running uh, test suits uh, again against it. So basically this would, uh, this would uh, make us pretty sure that the stack actually works uh, if you run the playbooks. So right now it is quite difficult. Uh, it is not that difficult to take just some parts of our uh, stack uh, our infrastructure, for example, a copper backend and copper RPM build, and use them without front end. Um, maybe it's even more easier to just take copper RPM build as the University uh, of uh, New York uh, done that, have done that. But uh, this is something we would like to Im improve, and uh, we would like to have those kind of scripts that are able, no matter what the uh, target machine is, what kind of machine it is, if it is a container virtual machine, bare metal, the playbooks should be the same, so that would be cool. Yes, Neil? The, uh, the other thing I was thinking about is, uh, what about building images like live media, disk images and stuff like that, because a lot of times people want to produce uh, right. something that shows off their, their code, and right. produce it for itself. Right. Uh, at the moment, I would say we are not exactly thinking about this, even though we were asked if this is possible with Copper already by the Tiger team from Tiger OS by from the University of New York, but uh, and uh, from other places also. But uh, right now we are not like really. We are focusing just f on development side of things and quick uh, distributions of uh, individual projects and we haven't got that far to think about making uh, an ISO from it or something that the user can install as a complete set of packages. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I, I hope that that's something we can about doing now. Okay, so maybe maybe in future, Nick? Uh, I, I, I will add something to that. Uh, actually, a lot of people are asking this kind of question where we can some images, uh, container images, etc. Uh, uh, in fact, even uh, some people in Red Hat are pushing for that. Uh, but uh, 
actually when it comes to the uh, to the money uh, uh, suddenly everyone st uh, stop stop their interest so uh, uh, yeah we can do that but it needs storage and if you are willing to pay for that storage contact me and we can do something about it but as, as uh, until today uh, everything stopped uh, when we come to the question of the storage and the money all right so we have no money for that <laughs> Yeah, that's something we could try. Okay. How big is the current system? Current system is not very big, I would say. Like we, we tend to trim it down as much as possible. So it consists of uh, copper front end, copper back end, copper disk kit, and copper RPM build. So and copper key again, which is generating keys. So those. To five packages basically take care of everything and I would say it's pretty small system and we would like to keep it that way and even make it more minimal but uh, we will see about it uh, all right okay so all right uh, so right now I think uh, on copper backend uh, we have around uh, six terabytes of disk space allocated, I would say. And on Cooper DiskKit is around four terabytes, which are basically DiskKit repos. Uh, I should re repeat the question. The question was how big uh, the current uh, deployment is. Uh, what, are our, uh, what are our requirements for the deployment? So it's uh, around 10 terabytes in total, I would say, of disk space. And uh, we are using OpenStack as a building platform. So we are using uh, virtual machines there, approximately around 30 to 40 builders. Usually <laughs> not every builder works. Usually it's only a uh, subset of them working. But uh, we also hope that this will uh, change. This will change in to, better, to better shape in the future. Uh, did that answer uh, the question? Thank you. Any other question? Well, uh, we are not rushing that. Mm, we have basically obsoleted API 1, API 2 by uh, the new API, but it might stay there for another year I would say or even longer if people actually uh, use it still the new API is uh, I, I would say much more pleasant uh, kind of development than the previous ones so we will uh, try to promote it but uh, we are not uh, actually um, rushing to, to deprecate and uh, remove old ones they can stay there you know, we, we have not, not a big issue with it we are we are just happy that we have finally a new API that is usable actually that somebody can use and be quite happy about using it. Right. 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 So, okay, so uh, the note or remark was that we should actually uh, state or say wh when we want to remove the previous APIs, so we need to talk about it in team and decide on, on the date, and um, we should be able to, to say some definite date. Uh, any other question? Okay, so that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention and that you have come. <laughs>